Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining Aurora Expedition's online information session on Scotland and Ireland today. So my name's Victoria and I work at Head Office for Aurora Expeditions and today I'll be joined by Carol Knott, one of our expedition team members, and also Martha Behan, who is our resident, tourism, uh, resident island expert. So hopefully we won't have any technical issues with the streaming today, but just to let you know, we are actually streaming from both Australia and from Scotland. Uh, so you, if you do notice a delay at any time, um, just bear with us because we're just streaming from multiple locations and no doubt you're joining us from somewhere in the world today. Uh, so just before we get stuck in, I just wanted to give you an overview of how today's session is going to run. So I'm gonna start with a little bit about us. Then I'm going to introduce our special guests. And then Carol is going to take us, uh, take you through where we go and travel to, and then about the history of the regions, both Scotland and Ireland. Uh, she's then going to give you an overview of wildlife and the day-to-day -day experience you can expect on an Aurora expedition. And then they'll both give you an overview of some of the voyages that we travel to. I'll then take over and cover our ships. And then we'll finish with a Q&A session where you can actually ask questions to either Carol or Martha who join us today. So if you wanna ask questions at any time, you'll see that there's a chat functionality in the pop-up session, a section of your screen where it's got the panel where you can, uh, with all the information on the webinar and being able to change control. So if you can just type in that chat box there, if you submit a question to us, um, we'll able to answer them at this session at the end. So feel free at any stage to submit a question there. So I'm just gonna turn off my webcam now. And then I'll give you a bit of an overview of who we are. So Aurora Expeditions has been um, around for a long time. So over 28 years. So a very experienced expedition cruise operator. And we were pioneered by Australian mountaineer, Greg Mortimer and his wife, Margaret Mortimer. So they started the business by just simply wanting to take friends to these wild remote places that we travel to throughout the world. Um, so the business started very organically and has grown um, thereafter. We have a very experienced expedition team that accompanies us on all of our voyages. And that compri is comprised of expedition leaders, um, both senior and deputy naturalists, historians like Carol, who joins us on the webinar today, uh, as well as photography guides, activity guides, and doctors. So this is the type of team you'll see on, on every voyage. We're all about maximum experience and that's why we deliberately keep our ship passenger numbers very small. So both of our ships have 126 passengers on board and we do that deliberately to maximise your time ashore. So we aim for two excursions per day and we have a very extensive activities program. And keeping the numbers small like this, we're able to tread lightly in some of the ecologically sensitive areas that we go to. And it also means that you're able to get off the ship more quickly and spend a lot more time ashore and not have to be rotated in groups for landings. Our ethos is to operate a very relaxed atmosphere on board. So we have a very um, approachable team. Um, we like to offer open seating dining for those that want to sit next to someone on board and have a chat, um, as well as an open bridge, which you can, which means that you can come into the bridge at any stage, um, see what's happening, um, perhaps even have a chat to the captain. Uh, and we only close the bridge if there's kind of technical uh it, you know, for tricky areas that we might need to traverse. Um, so that's, it can sometimes be closed, but generally it's always, always open. We also have a very informal atmosphere. So, you know, if, if you're in the Arctic with us and we see a polar bear in the middle of the night, um, you know, we'll often do an announcement and encourage you to come up in your pajamas and join us. So um, we like to, to keep things relaxed on board. We have very advanced ships. So this is our new ship you'll see just on the next screen, the Greg Mortimer, which is the first passenger ship in the world with the unique X, Alstein X bow. And this is um, this pointy nose is cleverly designed to actually um, get you there faster and more efficiently. So I'll talk a bit about that at the end of the webinar. And it's really been purpose built for expeditions. 
We like to travel responsibly. So we have a full range of activities we do on board that fits with that. So we have um, some of the lowest polluting marine engines in the world. Um, we operate on board um, recycling and, and the way we, um, and we recycle um, at the end through a specialised um, program that we partake in. Uh, and we also offer sustain sustainable seafood on board as well as many other features that you can learn about on our website. So now I'd like to introduce Carol Knott. So I'll just ask Carol to turn on her webcam if she's able to. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about Carol. So Carol is one of our most experienced historians who has traveled on board extensively with Aurora Expeditions. She has a passion for archeology, span which began with rescue excavations of medieval English towns, ports, churches, and castles. In 88, she returned to her native Scotland and since then has worked, um, lived and worked amongst the Outer Hebrides with field researchers focused on the archaeology arch of survival, which is a study of remote communities and deserted places. Uh, until 2012, Carol also worked for the National Trust of Scotland as an archaeologist for St Kilda, helping to understand and preserve the unique heritage of this world heritage site. So welcome, Carol. Thank you very much for joining us today from Scotland. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Great. Um, so thanks. I'll, um, I'll introduce Martha now and then I'll um, let you come back on and take over. So now I just want to introduce Martha as well. So Martha is Aurora Expedition's resident Irish expert. She hails from the Wicklow Mountains in Ireland and has spent summers in the west, on the west coast of Ireland in Connemara since she was a young child. She worked for Tourism Ireland for a number of years and in the words of her friend is the most Irish person you'll ever meet. Um, Martha, I don't know if you're there with your webcam. Um, well, I know you are, so um, just wanted to welcome you and say hi and thanks for joining me. Hi everyone, welcome. Great, thanks for that, Martha. Perfect. So now I'll pass on to um, Carol just to take you through a bit more about um, where we go and tell you in a bit more detail about Scotland and Ireland. Okay, hello then. Um, we would like to tell you about three voyages that um, we're particularly excited about, which are going to explore the islands and the coasts of Ireland and the west of Scotland and northern Scotland. And uh, the uh, the first one is a 13-day voyage and Martha will give you details about the itinerary shortly but this one starts in Dublin and uh, finishes in Cork but it really focuses on the extraordinary west coast of Ireland. Then we go a little bit further north and we have a trip which we called uh, Wild Scotland. This 11-day trip there's actually nothing tame about that trip at all. And it starts on the west coast and explores lots of the islands to the west and the north, and it finishes on the east coast. And our final one starts there again in Aberdeen on the east coast and explores the Northern Isles, Orkney, and then uh, leaves Scotland and travels northwards to the Faroe Isles and ends up in Svalbard in the high Arctic. So that's uh, just, a, I've, we're going to details about the itineraries, itineraries shortly, but that's just a quick overview of these three trips that we are, are really pleased that we'll be able to, to um, offer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the region, um, both Ireland and Scotland. They've got a deep and complex, rich history and it's relatively closely connected the two the two countries got a very common cultural heritage and um vicky i think i will need you to progress the slides um the um many of the islands such as st kilda which um is a dramatic island uh, like the, yes, here we are on the screen we can see st kilda which is a dramatic island about 45 kilometers offshore from the west of Scotland. And islands like this supported populations for thousands of years. This one was evacuated in 1930. And since then, 
it has become a wildlife reserve and a world heritage site, a UNESCO world Her heritage site, both for its natural history, which is extraordinary, and its cultural heritage. And in many ways, that's representative of many of the places that we might visit, uh, like a Great Blasket in, in Ireland and so on. Uh, but other places still have thriving communities. So we'll get to see both sides of that story. Um, the, and these remote places, these islands which we can go to one after the other um, are places that many people in Scotland know about, dream about, but they never get the chance uh, to most of them to ever see these fabulous places. So the last ice age ended here about 10,000 years ago, and the region has continuously developed um, since then, the landscape, the wildlife, and the people have all evolved together. So they are inextricably intertwined. It's impossible to separate the landscape and the wildlife and the people. And that makes it slightly different from some of the other wilderness destinations that, uh, that Aurora takes us to. So here we're looking at the standing stones of Callanish on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. And that's where I'm speaking to you from right now. That's my home in the Isle of Lewis. And they represent an incredible event that happened about 6,000 years ago. A remarkable civilization developed. And uh, these were farmers, early farmers, the new stone age, not yet the use of metal, but they developed this incredibly sophisticated civilization. And they left megalithic monuments like this all over Scotland and Ireland, and we'll get the chance to explore some of them. Next slide, please. Um, unlike most of Europe, uh, the regions we are exploring here were not much affected by the Roman Empire. And so the story here is one of continuity from one era to another. And over time, a number of kingdoms developed throughout Ireland and Scotland. And these kingdoms spoke a Gaelic language, they spoke Celtic languages, Gaelic, Irish, Gaelic, Scots, Gaelic. And these king, this here we have a, um, a, tip, a, a, a wonderful example of a royal seat. This is um, in Ireland and it's um, the uh, ring, it's a stone ring fort. Uh, which was the seat of a royal kingdom in, in Ireland here, and um, on top of a hill on a much more ancient site. So this gives us an idea of some of the um, early historic sites that we will be able to visit, Brian and Aviela here in Donegal, and the, um, built, the stonework from about the 6th or 7th century on a much more ancient site. Uh, and as well as ritual prehistoric sites and these great royal seats and centers of power uh, in Ireland. Ireland adopted Christianity very early on and here at Skellig Michael, this is on a rock uh, off way off the coast of southwest Ireland. It's a remarkable early Christian site. These beehive cells where a small community of dedicated monks lived some tiny chapels are built in the 6th and 7th centuries uh, AD. They um, were looking for a desert place in the sea where they could really practice this very, very specific kind of Celtic Christianity. This place was ravaged, of course, by the Vikings more than a thousand years ago. And the Vikings represent the very, the next really significant layer in the cultural story that we'll be exploring here. Uh, Dublin, for example, was founded by the Vikings, and in the north of Scotland, the islands of Orkney and Shetland, they remain part of the Viking and later the Scandinavian world, right up to the 1460s, when they were passed from the Kingdom of Norway to the Kingdom of Scotland. And if you go on that trip, you'll hear lots from the local people about that. Uh, and here you can see a detail on Skellig Michael, up in that monastery, high up in the clouds, close to heaven, a tiny cemetery, monk cemetery, and the cross of the founder of that community. Uh, next slide, please, Vicky. 
you'll see, uh, I think the next slide shows us another um, island in Scotland on Iona. Yes, here we are. And like uh, Skellig Michael, this is a famous monastery founded again in the 6th century by St Columba. And uh, this was responsible for the conversion of much of Scotland and far beyond that as well. Uh, again, it was also um, settled by the Vikings. And when the Benedictine Abbey and this nunnery were founded in 1200, um, all this part of Scotland belonged to Norway before it was Scottish. So um, they, uh, this is a really significant historical site that we will uh, hopefully get a chance to visit. And um, uh, Scotland, of course, was an independent country until it joined England and became the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in 1707. Ireland, on the other hand, was dominated by English rule on and off uh, from the Norman period from the 12th century onwards until the 1920s when it uh, won its independence apart from Northern Ireland. So uh, today, uh, the greater part of Ireland, Southern Ireland era is an independent country and still very much part of the European Union, while Northern Ireland is part of the um, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And uh, in, um, in these places, as well as history and the landscapes and the geology, and all of that, we will get a chance to see some very um, delightful wildlife. A lot of seabirds. Here you've got the puffin, and this is everybody's favourite bird. It's uh, just a great joy to go to these puffin colonies and see the birds uh, uh, raising their young and fishing and bringing back all these little sand eels to uh, feed their pufflings, their offspring with. This slide shows a range of some of the seabirds that you will see on the bottom of the slide here. The puffins, of course, the Atlantic puffins. And uh, in the middle, you have guillemots uh, as well. This is the common guillemot. You also have black guillemots and razorbills and many other species of seabirds. And on the right hand side there, you can see the northern gannet. We'll visit some spectacular gannet colonies. Uh, both in Ireland and in the Scotland trips, where the sky is just dotted with thousands upon thousands of pairs of these fantastic breeding gannets. Uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of marine wildlife. So there's whales, such as the minke whale here, you can see on the left. It's the smallest of the baleen whales. We also have killer whales or orcas. They're not always in some places so easy to uh, encounter, but in others that's more common. Uh, seals, harbour seals are illustrated here, are common seals, and also the Atlantic grey seals are here in great numbers. And dolphins, of course, porpoises and numerous species of dolphins. So we will always be on the lookout for marine life, seabirds and marine mammals. So next slide, please, the key. Uh, what happens day to day? Uh, in this area, there's a lot to see in a relatively compact area. So we don't have so much in the way of long sea days. Uh, it's a very uh, full and uh, um, uh, rich program that we can offer. So the idea is that after breakfast, we usually ready for our first outing and everyone has been with us before on an Aurora expedition will know how that is. Uh, so we'll go ashore in the morning, maybe do a landing, a hike, go and watch wildlife or it might be a zodiac cruise and uh, whatever the best opportunities to see wildlife or to take advantage of the um, area that we're in, then back to the ship for lunch, uh, reposition and go out again in the afternoon for another experience and then back to the ship um, at the end of the afternoon, a chance to relax, briefings, presentations and dinner on board the ship. So um, here you can see illustrated some of those aspects. The Zodiac cruises are, are really a fantastic aspect of expedition cruises. It really makes it quite a distinctive 
part of, of this kind of cruise. They're strong, sturdy work horses. We go out to a small group of people, a handful of people, with your naturalist or your expert guide driver who can really bring to life the places that we're exploring, and um, sometimes below cliffs, sometimes into caves, or sometimes just out there amongst wildlife or just a beautiful place. When we go ashore, we uh, offer a variety of walks and hikes, sometimes to be a gentle stroll to spend time uh, chilling out with the wildlife, or other times it might be more vigorous hikes. But we always like to offer a variety to suit every taste and every pace uh, of our guests. So there's always plenty of choices that you can make. And when we go ashore, we'll see a huge variety of historical sites and uh, meet the local people and meet uh, as much of the local wildlife as we possibly can. So uh, that's the kind of uh, day, the kind of daily experiences that, that, we, that we look forward to. And on the next slide, uh, you can see here some of the add-on activities. So if you want uh, a slightly more adventurous experience, you can sign up for one of our specific activities, such as kayaking. And if you uh, come along as a kayaker, you don't miss anything that the rest of us do, but you get an added dimension, uh, seeing things from the, uh, the wonderful platform of your kayak. Uh, sometimes we also are able to do paddle boarding, uh, this one here on the left is in Scotland, again on the Isle of Lewis, uh, on one of our really beautiful beaches. And uh, also some of our trips have diving uh, groups as well, so you can go as a, as a diver. So we really try to get off the ship as much as possible. We want to be out there in the environment experiencing it all, but life on board the ship is uh, pretty nice as well. Uh, there's great facilities for uh, relaxing in the library, in the bar, in the sauna and so on. Uh, but uh, there's great observation facilities. So from the ship, it's a pretty nice place to uh, see what's flying by, see what's swimming by in the water, the beautiful scenery going by. And we always have guides and naturalists up there pointing out what there is to be seen and doing as much spotting as we can. So that's some sort of general background to the region and the experience. But now we can talk a little bit about the voyages that we're highlighting here. This one is uh, Ireland. And you can see from this image just really why it's called the Emerald Island. But Martha is going to tell us about that in a minute. But uh, first of all, I'm going to talk to a little bit about Wild Scotland. Uh, so the, it's an 11 day trip and you can see from the map here down on the left hand side that we start in the town of Oban there on the west side of uh, the coast and this is a really pretty harbour town it's in a stunning setting overlooked by a castle Donolly Castle which is the seat of Clan Maclean so here we really are in clan territory and uh, on the, the first morning, the first full morning out, we'll visit the island of Iona that I mentioned, uh, which is such a historic and beautiful, one of our most historic spots in Scotland, where St. Columba or Colin Key founded that sixth century monastery. And today it's still got a very special atmosphere. Lots of people still um, love it as a kind of spiritual, sacred place. Then we'll go on to the small isles. The islands to the west of Scotland are called the Hebrides, the Inner and the Outer Hebrides. And we will go to um, explore those, and then we'll go to the Isle of Skye and explore the Black Cullen Mountains and visit some remote uh, sites that are great for hiking and uh, history. And then we'll go out right out to the outermost of the Hebrides, out to St Kilda. This is all weather dependent, but we hope to land there if the weather is uh, suitable. And that is another real highlight of the trip. Then we come back to Lewis, which is my home to the Standing Stones of Callanish, 
some fabulous beaches and then on to some remote islands at the north end of these archipelagos. All these areas that I've talked about are in the Gaeltacht. So that's the Gaelic speaking part of Scotland. Everyone speaks English, of course, but Gaelic was the original Celtic language of this area. Then we move on to a different cultural zone. Then we go to Shetland, which is up there in the north. And this is in the Scandinavian sphere. Uh, and um, we we'll visit archaeological sites, do some fantastic cruises, meet some remote um, communities, go down to Fair Isle, where that uh, knitwear comes from, and visit Orkney, which is the Neolithic capital of Scotland, uh, the New Stone Age, 6,000 years ago. What's happening there is just unbelievable. And then we'll finish in the busy port, North Sea port of Aberdeen. And some of the uh, images that we've got next will show some of the highlights of this trip. This is the island of Staffa, an incredible volcanic um, island with the famous Fingal's Cave. And here you can see some of our zodiacs just outside the cave. And uh, on a really calm day, it's also possible to take a zodiac inside the cave. It's an incredible experience. There's also a puffin colony on top of the island, which uh, we hope to go and visit when we can. And on the next slide, we'll see another one of the highlights, which um, is, I believe, uh, oh, oh yes, of course, here's some of the puffins that breed on Staffa and so many of the other islands around. And then uh, I think we have some images of sky coming up, which um, we will visit and can do some remote hikes on around the island of Skye and also visit, yes, here you have this dramatic uh, uh, topography on Skye. And we do some walks around the lochs and the mountains and the coast there and see some ancient sites. And uh, I then passing on to the next slide, oh yes, here we are, Kerrang in sky. You can see it's a photographer's dream. Uh, we'll leave, leave with some stunning images and our photographers on board will be there to inspire and encourage as well. There's wildlife too and domestic life. Here's a highland cow and like all the inhabitants of Scotland, they might look a bit fierce, but they're really pretty friendly. Uh, we also have red deer, our, uh, which is our largest native wild animal on Scotland. And we finish up in the Northern Isles. Here we are in Shetland at the incredible multi-period site of Jarlsop. And here we are exploring houses, domestic buildings, incredibly well preserved, that go all the way from 6,000 years ago, the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, all the way through continuously until the 18th century when Sir Walter Scott visited it and Im immortalized it under the name of Jarlsof. So that's an idea of some of the uh, highlights of a trip in Scotland. And now I will pass you over to Martin to talk about the Irish trip. Thanks, Carol. Um, so this is our Ireland's West Coast voyage, and it's a brand new destination for our expeditions. It's 13 days, and it will be departing in May 2021, so next year aboard the Greg Mortimer. Um, this is a completely unique trip of Ireland's West Coast. Uh, there's no other tour operator accessing these islands or connecting the islands together like this. Um, the itinerary is really a deep dive into remnants of an ancient Gaelic culture that's been intertwined with a very harsh life um, on the Atlantic. We'll be accessing areas and islands that are more often than not completely off the tourist trail. And we've consulted with locals of these islands and communities on the development of this itinerary. They've been able to give us access to islands that you would just normally not be able to access as a tourist. The kind of animals and wildlife that we'd expect to see would be, of course, puffins, which you've seen lots of pictures of so far, grey and harbour seals, 
uh, bottlenose dolphins, Connemara ponies, the native pony uh, from Ireland, wild donkeys, red deer, guillemots, corn crakes, and a lot of these islands are teeming with marine birds and native flora and fauna. We're also delighted to have Greg Mortimer, our co-founder, special guest, to launch this new destination for us. Greg's traveled to Ireland many times before, but is really excited to see it from a completely different angle and explore um, some islands that he hasn't got a chance to land on before. But we'll have an incredible lineup um, of expedition team uh, with naturalists from the area, historians, activity guides like kayaking, Irish explorers and local musicians, which will really bring this voyage of Ireland's fascinating west coast to life. So you can see from the map there that we depart from Dublin, uh, which was founded by the Vikings, as Cal mentioned earlier. And um, we'll spend a day in Dublin first and then leave the following day from Dublin. And our first landing, we will land in County Donegal um, the, on the beautiful Inishowen Peninsula. And then we really work our way down the west coast of Ireland and its islands. So just go on to the next slide there. So our first landing will be in County Donegal and the Inisho Peninsula, as I said, and then we'll be working our way down that really jagged county. Um, and it was named by Lonely Planet two years ago as the coolest place on the planet. It's a very, very rugged landscape. Um, and one of the highlights would be Schlieve Cliffs. And um, you can't tell how high these are from this picture um, as the sheep are precariously perched on top but these are the highest sea cliffs in Europe, and we'd hope to get out and do some zodiac cruising and some kayaking below them. And then we'll be moving on down to County Sligo, just on the next slide. And County Sligo is fondly referred to as Yates country. And pictured here, this is Mullig Moor, and it resides in the shadows of the iconic Ben Bulban Mountain, which is one of Ireland's most distinctive mountains. You can see it in the background there, and it has, it's not very clear, it's a little bit misty in this picture, but it has these amazing furrows going down the side of it. Um, and then it's sometimes referred to as Ireland's Table Mountain because of its flat top. And you can see in the foreground there, sorry, just back one slide, that's Classy Bourne Castle, which was the residence of Lord Mountbatten until his death in 1979. Uh, so we'll have a choice of two walks here to explore this very romantic landscape um, and the mountains that inspired the work of Nobel um, winning poet W.B. Yeats. And W.B. Yeats is actually buried at the foot of Ben Bulban as per his wishes um, in his epitaph um, penned under Ben Bulban. So then we're making our way down to the Connemara, just on the next slide. And we'll be enjoying an authentic trad session, as they're often referred to, um, of traditional music played by local musicians and perhaps some of the Irish expedition team as well. Um, also, in partnership with a local food project, our expeditions will be hosting a Connemara food experience ashore, uh, where we'll be talking into a unique West Coast meal cooked from responsibly caught fish um, and locally grown and foraged produce. Then we're going to spend four days exploring, hiking and kayaking the Connemara region um, and the scattered islands of the Gael Tot, kind of the Irish speaking or Gaelga uh, speaking region um, off the coast of the Connemara. So this is one of the hikes that we hope to do uh, with beautiful views over the islands. Um, we'll be exploring Connemara National Park and Killary Fjord and exploring um, lots of the islands around the Connemara, but these um, are just an example of some of them that we'll be exploring, which would be Inish Boffin um, and the Aran Islands. Uh, also, weather permitting, we'll be accessing some privately owned islands um, that host an ancient uh, past. A lot of these islands were abandoned in the 1920s up to the 1960s um, because life became too harsh to live out there and there was government initiatives to move people back to the mainland because it became, became too dangerous to live there when the weather got bad and there was emergencies and no one could access these islands to receive medical attention. So they've since returned to nature. Um, so that's why it's so important that they'll like that 
we get good weather to land on them because a lot of their harbors and piers have since collapsed um, and wildlife and the native flora and fauna have really taken over. So pictured here um, is Dune Engesa um, on top of Inishmoor in the Aran Islands. And this is a prehistoric hill fort atop a 300 foot cliff. And the Aran Islands um, are famous in literature and poetry and for its craft traditions, which we'll see on the next slide. So very famous for the Aran jumpers, which you might have heard of before. And they were traditionally worn by fishermen um, and would have originally actually been waterproof because of the lanolin in the sheep's wool. Um, and each Aran jumper would be unique to a fisherman's family. Um, and this would be to possibly help identify them if they were found um, if they were found out at sea, if they were found, uh, if they drowned out at sea, they could be able to identify them to a certain family. You can also see a crease belt here. Um, and this would have also had distinctive patterns on it and set of colours to distinguish what family that fisherman came from. So during the 19, uh, sorry, during the 17th and 18th centuries, Ireland came under English and penal law which meant that many aspects of Irish tradition, um, including religion, language and dress were banned. So for this reason, the crease um, and um, the iron jumpers uh, and many other aspects of folk costume survived only in the remotest parts of Ireland, like the Aran Islands or these islands off the coast. But we'll be learning all about Ireland's weaving and linen history and the cultural importance to the islanders on this trip as well. So after the Aran Islands, um, we'll be sailing past the Cliff, Cliffs of Moker, and then we'll be going on to um, Kerry and the Dingle Peninsula and the Blasket Islands. So we hope to land and explore the Dingle Peninsula, which hosts over 2,500 archaeological sites dating back as far as 6,000 BC. And it hosts one of the richest and most varied concentrations of archaeological monuments in Western Europe. And then uh, we hope to land on the Blasket Islands, which comprises of six islands off the coast of Kerry. And pictured here, this is a group of wild donkeys on Great Blasket Island. People lived here um, prior to the 1950s, but has since become abandoned. Again, very similar um, that it became, it was a government initiative to move people off the island because of the harsh weather conditions, but we'll be exploring some of their old school houses um, and their um, the abandoned homes there on the Blasket Islands. And it was a big of extreme um, interest to linguists, the people that lived on the Blasket Islands, because of its isolation, um, a very old version of the Irish language that had remained unchanged for hundreds of years existed there. So there, there is a really interesting history with the Blasket Islands and their unique traditions. So we'll be exploring the Blasket Islands, which would be very interesting. And then we'll be, we hope to land on the Skelligs, um, just on the next slide, which Carol spoke about. That's when we saw that close-up picture of the beehive huts that, that monks, those monks had built that monastery atop this mountain. And um, so the Skelligs are two islands that are really just shards of rocks that are jutting up from the Atlantic. So that makes it all the more impressive that these monks built that monastery atop um, of this island, you can see it there on the right, and there is a puffin um, sitting on one of the steps. So that monastery is sitting at the very top of this island, um, and you can see the winding steps down there on the island to the left-hand side, and there's 600 slate steps that you have to climb in order to see um, the, the monastery there from the 6th century. Um, and then there's also a six, um, a protected puffin colony as well there. So then sitting beside it is Skellig Bjog, which we can't land on. It's much more sharp and jugged than Skellig Michael. And that's where we'll witness um, the second largest Gannet colony um, all in the world. There's roughly 27,000 um, pairs of Gannets on there. So that's an amazing sight. And you can see them, all the puffins and all the Gannets diving off these islands, and then all the gray and harbor seals sitting below, hoping for any chicks to fall into the water. So it's a, an amazing sight seeing these two islands together. There's just so much wildlife there um, and just an amazing, um, feet that these monks lived out here so remotely and built this this little monastery at the top of them. 
So then we'll finish off in, after the Skelligs, we'll finish off in Cove in County Cork. And that uh, was the final destination of the Titanic. So that's where we conclude our Ireland trip. So now I'm going to hand back to Carol and she's going to bring us through the Orkneys, Faroes, Yamine and Svalbard trip. Yes. So um, to finish with the third in our suite of uh, voyages that we want to tell you about today, this is the northernmost of the sites, if you can go back to the map. There we are. So it's a 15 day trip and it will start in Aberdeen on the east coast of Scotland there, this very bustling seaport in the North Sea, very full of fishing boats. And then it will head north to Orkney. And Orkney is the, uh, we'll see uh, some very famous archaeological sites there. Scarrow Bray, uh, the sort of um, uh, incredibly well-preserved Neolithic site, 6,000 years old, a whole cluster of houses complete with all their furniture, their stone furniture, just as if the people just left the premises just, uh, just before we got there. Uh, standing stones and uh, this is the place where very significant excavations are happening at the moment in the Neolithic heart of Orkney which is really changing the way we understand this incredibly sophisticated civilization. Back then it wasn't a remote corner of Europe, it really was where it was all happening and we're just learning more about that every year. Then we will head northwards again. We'll go. To, we'll leave Scotland, and we'll go to the Faroe Islands. Uh, these dramatic islands, which, unlike everywhere else that we've talked about so far, were never inhabited until those intrepid monks in the sixth and seventh centuries set out in their small boats and set up a monastery there, uh, monastic cells there. Vikings discover it as well, and it's been inhabited. Uh, as part of the Scandinavian world ever since. It's a really interesting place. Then we'll continue northwards through the rest of the North Atlantic and we'll head for the mysterious islands of Jan Mayan and uh, uh, see whether or not it's possible to land there. And we'll end up in the high Arctic in Svalbard or Spitsbergen. Uh, and we now have some images to illustrate some of these highlights of this incredible trip. Uh, the first one that's coming up will be the uh, some of these Neolithic sites on Orkney. If you can change the slides, Vicky. Um, as, as I mentioned, Orkney, here we are, these are the stones of Stennes. Uh, in the Neolithic heart of Orkney, it's part of an extensive UNESCO World Heritage Site here. And, uh, we get the chance to uh, visit the town of Kirkwall, the magnificent Viking cathedral, before we head on up here to the Pharaohs. The scenery here is dramatic. The cliffs are unbelievable. The villages perched in some of the most unlikely places. The way of life of the people here, the history, their Viking roots, and their pride in their language they speak, Faroese, uh, which is uh, similar to Icelandic and which really is the closest survivor of the old Norse language, which the Vikings spoke more than a thousand years ago. So their culture is very strong, something they're very proud of. The next slide also shows some of the traditional buildings with their turf roofs. And again, the most unlikely uh, villages clinging to these uh, high, rocky, but very um, uh, productive farms high up in the, in the above the cliffs of the Faroe Islands. Then we will head north and we will approach Jan Mayan Island. And I have never yet got the chance to go there, so I'm very, very excited at the possibility of seeing it and hopefully even landing on it if the weather is suitable. Um, this was the centre of, in the 16th and 17th centuries, of whaling, the Greenland whaling industry, which many nations of Europe took part in. And uh, after Jan Mayen, we will then head up to the high Arctic, up to Spitsbergen, up to Svalbard, where we will 
uh, look for wildlife. It's, of course, the famous as the land of the polar bears, but there's also many other wonderful fauna there, walruses, seals, whales, and the land animals, the Arctic foxes. And here you have the Svalbard reindeer, a very uh, distinctive subspecies of reindeer or um, related to the caribou. So it's a trip that is full of variety and fascination. Now I'll pass you back to Victoria to uh, tell you more information. Great. So we're on the home stretch and only a, a few minutes more to go, but I just wanted to finish you uh, finish off by telling you a little bit about our ships and then move to the Q&A section. So fortunately, we don't have too many of our pictures yet in uh, Scotland because obviously the ship's just starting. It's, it's just almost finishing, actually. It's inaugural season in Antarctica. Um, so you'll see these are quite polar images, but we should have some great ones in Scotland soon. So this I mentioned before is the Ulstein X-Bow, which is this weird looking no shape on the ship, which is really effective at piercing the waves versus riding them, which means a much, much smoother, more comfortable ride on board and also a greater fuel efficiency because of the way the ship moves through the waves. So this is a really uh, unique feature that we've, we've just launched and we're the first ship to have. The ship's been really designed for viewing beautiful scenery and wildlife, as you can see here in this picture. So it has uh, 360 observation decks. So you'll have the observation um, deck on the top of the ship. You can go outside the deck in front of um, the bridge. Then there's a huge back deck where you can also uh, see at the back of. And then we have these additional things on the Greg Mortimer, these um, fold out hydraulic viewing platforms, which can give you another perspective as well. So. Uh, and then there's obviously lots of nice places to sit inside with a with a warm cup of tea or coffee, as you'll see on the next slide. So I've just featured um, actually on, on the Sylvia Earl, as opposed to the hydraulic viewing platforms, we feature this unique glass atrium lounge, which sits inside the bow. We also have inside lounges, as I mentioned. So this is the observation lounge on deck eight. Uh, but you can also obviously view from the inside on the bridge, um, as well as in the main dining and bar and lecture areas. So lots of places to have uh, a nice look outside. The ship's been really designed for adventure and purpose built for what we do, which is expedition cruising. So on the left, you'll see our activity preparation area, which is where our kayakers and divers get ready for their outings. And you can see them getting ready in that picture. We also have a mudroom, which is where you go down before you get out onto the zodiacs and you put on your muck boots, which we loan you as part of the experience. Um, you'll have your jacket on, which you can either store in your cabin or down here, um, which we give you um, to keep. And then you put on your flotation um, device and, and get ready to go out for, uh, for, uh, for a bit of an adventure. So on the right hand side, you'll see two zodiac lo loading platforms. We have four in total on the ship. And you go from the mudroom out into these Zodiac launching platforms and jump into your Zodiacs ready for your expedition. Um, I say jumping loosely. Obviously, it's um, we give you a good technique to make sure you can get in them safely um, and, and effectively. So that's a bit about how the ship's been designed for expeditions. There's also lots of opportunities to relax and unwind on board. As Carol said, we the ship's really designed to get you off it and to immerse you in nature. But in, there's lots of nice areas um, to come back and we see lots of people in the bar looking at some of their fantastic photos from the day or attending lectures on the wildlife and history of the area. And we have our library, which will have lots of fantastic books on the region. Um, and then you're welcome to obviously relax in your cabin um, and then come down at meal times to enjoy a hearty meal after probably a fresh outing in Scotland or Ireland. So now it's time for the Q&A section. So I'm just going to ask um, Martha and Carol to turn back on their uh, microphones and, and turn on their webcams if they can. Um, so I'll just see if we have any questions, further questions. So um, Carol, I had a first one for you actually. Um, uh, that someone was wanting to know what your favourite part of the expedition, of a Scot Scottish expedition is. Oh, my favourite part. Oh, I never know how to answer this question. As a historian, I love the historical sites, Iona, St Kilda, uh, Orkney and Shetland. 
but um, the natural history is spectacular as well. But I have to say that on the Scotland trip, coming to the Isle of Lewis, which is my home, has a special place in my heart. Hmm. Nice. And then similar question um, for you, Martha, also from um, Sari. What's your favourite part of the island voyage? What would you see as a highlight? Oh, I think you're on mute, Martha. So we'll just turn you back off. That's all right. Yep, you're back Sorry. on. Um, I really like exploring the Connemara, um, although I've gone there for nearly every summer of my life um, since I was very, very young. There's just so much to do around there and there's so many islands off the coast of the Connemara that are privately owned and we just, when we, what I would do when we're in the summer is we would go out on some of the like, traditional boats and we would just try and land up on these islands. It was very dependent on the swell, but once you get up, there's just so much to explore and we're constantly finding new places. Um, and so it's quite a sheltered part as well, the Connemara. Um, so the islands take quite a lot of the brunt of the weather. So sheltered from there, you have amazing turquoise water in kind of the inlets of the Connemara. So there's there's amazing snorkeling, which is kind of hard to believe. You wouldn't think that you'd want to go snorkeling in such cold waters, but it looks very inviting. It is cold, um, but on a sunny day to go into that water, it's crystal clear and very, very beautiful. And there's just amazing hikes around um, Connemara where you just get these incredible views and and vistas of all the little dotted islands off the coast. So the Connemara is my favourite, and then Schellig Michael and the Schelligs is absolutely amazing as well. With those two. Great. Thanks, thanks, Martha. And then another one for you, Carol. Um, how fit do we need to be? That's from Sheena. How fit? Um, you. Um, we try to cater for everybody. So if you are bursting with energy, we can organize hikes and activities that will burn some of that off. But uh, we, um, we also have plenty of activities. If you, when we do landings, if you just want to sit on the beach and uh, watch world go by, that's fine as well. So we try to cater for every level of, of fitness. Great. And then just another question as um, well. This uh, was from Ruth. Um, what are the chances of seeing polar bears um, reasonably close at hand? So presumably, I believe she's talking about the Orkney, Sparrows, uh, Yanmine, Svalbard trip. Um, so yeah, what are the chances of seeing polar bears? Um, that's, again, that's another really difficult question to answer. Uh, the trips that are are exclusively dedicated to the high Arctic have a higher chance of more encounters with polar bears and at closer quarters, potentially. Uh, on this trip, uh, there's only maybe uh, a third, a quarter of the trip will be around Svalbard. So the more days you're there, the more chances there are to see polar bears. But the magnificent thing about the Arctic is you just have no guarantees. It's um, so exciting to go out there and everybody is watching, everybody is on edge and looking, looking, looking for the polar bears. And sometimes they might turn up in the middle of the night. And so sometimes we get a soft voice coming over the intercom saying, get up, get up, there's a bear just outside the ship on the ice. But um, it's just impossible to predict. Great, thanks Carol. Yeah, so um, Ruth, we have another voyage called Svalbard Odyssey, which spends a lot more time up in uh, Svalbard and also a um, Arctic Complete tour. So they they um, spend a lot of time in Svalbard and cruising up in the sea ice looking for bears. So that's um, those are your voyages with the best chance of, of seeing polar bears. And then um, just one last question from Laura. Uh, or actually I'll ask this one to Carol. So what, um, what, how, what do you need to wear? Is it, you know, obviously we run trips right. to the polar regions, but for Scotland how as well, but how would you dress for the Scot Scotland? Right, the weather here is characterized by mildness. So it's not going to be incredibly cold. It's not going to be incredibly hot most of the time, but it's changeable. And we do have rain 
and we do have windy conditions sometimes. So you want your layers and you certainly want to bring waterproofs with you, a waterproof jacket, well, you'll have a waterproof jacket and waterproof trousers will provide the muck boots. So um, it's a place where they say four seasons in one day. The weather can be beautiful, calm, settled and sunny, in which case you will definitely need your sunscreen, but expect it to be changeable. Uh, and if, there's, if it's windy, it will feel colder than the actual temperature. So just be flexible and be prepared. Great, thanks very much. So I think we're running out of time. So um, thank you so much, Martha, for joining us from Sydney at the moment and Carol for joining us all the way from Scotland. Really appreciate it. And yeah, th thanks once again. Oh, you're welcome, pleasure. Great, so I'll just move on to the next slide, um, which is just to let you know if you have traveled with us before, you're actually entitled to an additional discount off to the 20 to 25% discount we're offering on our Scotland and Ireland voyages at the moment and lots of other onboard benefits. So have a look on our website um, in the loyalty program section just to find out what you're entitled to if you travel with us before. But thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you found that informative and helpful. Um, if you want to take the next step and join Carol on the Wild Scotland Tour or some of our Irish expedition team in Ireland, um, contact us or your preferred travel agent. Um, and we've just got some call uh, some contact details which we'll include in an email with a recording of the webinar as well in about um, 48 hours time. Uh, but yes, please reach out to us or a travel agent if you're interested in traveling with us. So thanks very much again for joining us today. We hope you found it uh, useful and we wish you a very good day or evening wherever you are in the world. Thanks again.